Hi and welcome along to what I'm hoping you're finding to be um, quite an interesting but relatively quick dash through cosmology. Supernovas get a whole video to themselves because they're uh, kind of so important in terms of our modern understanding um, of the universe. Perhaps we have a quick reminder of what a supernova is. Um, so at the end of a star's life when the nuclear reactions stop, um, the main type of supernova, the nuclear reactions stop if we've got a uh, a star of more than 1.4 solar masses or more strictly um, if the core has a mass of more than 1.4 solar masses gravity will take over um, we will get this collapse down to a neutron star, star or a black hole and a, a huge huge amount of energy given out we'll see just how much energy later now we're just going to take a little diverge to the side um, because when we talked about um, redshift, um, Hubble's law uh, and the expanding universe, one of the things we didn't talk about at all was how do we know about how far um, away things are in space? It's a huge um, and fascinating subject, um, real big personal interest of mine. It's a fantastic book called um, Measuring the Universe by Kitty Ferguson. Um, well worth getting hold of if you're you're interested in this stuff. But I'm just going to tell you one aspect of how we know how far away things are in the universe. And the general term for what I'm talking about is standard candles. OK, so what on earth does that mean? So we're going to do a thought experiment. I'm going to um, send you guys out into a field. Um, and I'm going to give you each a candle to hold. OK, so it's completely dark. All I can see is the light of four candles arranged in front of me. And I've given the task of working out where you are. Well, just like in astronomy, um, it's fairly easy to work out what direction you are. How am I going to know how far you are away? Because if this candle looks dimmer than that candle, is that because this was not a very good candle it doesn't give out very much light or is it that it's much further away however had i given you all a standard candle if i know the light output of all of these stand candles is identical on a simple level we can just say the brightest candle is the nearest candle and the dimmest candle is the furthest and we can put them in distant out order of how far they are away more importantly, um, if we actually manage to measure the amount of light, the brightness of the light, the amount of en energy arriving per meter squared, then we can use the butter gun. We can use the inverse square law to actually then calculate distances to these stars. Now, we don't actually use the butter gun. What we're going to use is um, the relationship between um, absolute magnitude and apparent magnitude uh, and in effect what and this we haven't shown the derivation of this um, that's just a big video rendering behind me um, the, the we have we haven't talked about where this came from but it's based on the it's based on the inverse square law um, and if you look at it, it, it it's simple if you look at a star or something in space you can always measure it's apparent magnitude. That's just a matter of you know pointing a telescope with a calibrated CCD on it. If you know the absolute magnitude, if you know inherently how bright this is, then there's only one unknown left in the equation. Uh, that's the distance, and we can find out how far it is away to the object. So in effect, actually, su perhaps surprisingly, if you've not seen this before, the search for distance is actually the search for known brightness. And it's turned out that the um, a special type of supernova, the Type 1a supernova, has been the driving force um, be on our search for um, a really good way of measuring dis big distances in space. Uh, not technically what you need to know, but I think it's always worth kind of mentioning these things. So how do we know? in terms of observation why there are some supernovas are different and given this designation 1a essentially they're supernovas that explode and it doesn't appear that the light is passing through hydrogen 
So it appears that the thing exploding isn't the core of a star surrounded by hydrogen outer layers. And you'll see why that is in a moment. So this is our, our kind of model for what's happening um, it, with the type 1a supernova. We imagine a binary star system. So we talked about that in relation to Doppler. So we've got these two objects going around each other. And we're imagining that, that one um, is a white dwarf. So in other words, it's a, a, a star, a smaller star that's exploded, leaving um, just the core behind. And that that um, has got a mass of less than 1.4 solar masses, but not massively less. And we can conceive, can't we, that the gravity of this, if, if um, there's material coming off um, this star or some other object, it's losing mass. The gravity of this star over time can increase, can gather more mass. And then we've got a situation where we're moving up and up and up till we get to 1.4 solar masses. And when we get to 1.4 solar masses, then we get this um, giant explosion. The gravity takes over uh, uh, and we form a neutron star. We would definitely form a neutron star, not a black hole because we haven't got enough mass. But the crucial thing is because we've slowly crept up to this same mass every time, as far as we know, every type 1a supernova has the same brightness. It has the same absolute magnitude. And as I've just shown you on the previous uh, sheet of paper, if we know the absolute magnitude, then we know how far away um, we know how far away the object is. It also helps, and we'll talk about more of this in a moment. That this is incredibly bright. You'll just you'll start to see just how bright in a moment. But that really really helps, doesn't it? Because if these are incredibly bright. Um, then we will be able to see them for a really long way away. And the only problem with them is that they don't shine continuously, do they? They're the remains of an explosion. So they're just going to shine for a relatively, um, relatively brief period of time. So we have to keep looking for them. Uh, it used to be done by kind of eccentric going out at night, looking at galaxies and looking for them with an extra blob of light in. Now it's really automated and we've really uh, invested a huge amount in kind of scanning so computers scanning pictures looking for uh, looking for these sudden extra bits of bright compared to library photographs and then taking spectra um, doing the doppler shift to work out um, how fast these stars how fast these are going away due to the expansion of the universe so what we need to do now is we need to relate this back to the hubble's law graph OK, so the Hubble's law graph said that if we plot a graph of the distance to something in megaparsecs against um, the velocity of recession in kilometers per second, we get a straight line. And I said that Hubble, we worked out the age of the universe. And when we did that, I said that Hubble's law is um, based on the idea that the rate of expansion has been constant. And if you think about it, for all kinds of reasons, it seems unlikely that the rate of expansion um, has been constant. Why would we suspect that the rate of expansion um, wouldn't be constant? Well, because in the past, we would have thought the universe would have been expanding faster, wouldn't we? Because um, gravity is pulling on everything. We can imagine all these galaxies flying apart. Galaxies is, the galaxies are being pulled back in by gravity. So we'd have thought if we go back far enough in time and remember obviously the further the further away something is if we look at something which is uh, a million light years away then we're looking back a million years in time and of course we're looking back much further than that we're looking back billions of years here so we would have thought earlier in the universe if we look back far enough and this is what the type the supernova data was for you'd have thought we would find that the universe was expanding faster in the past. But when we actually start plotting the supernova data to expand our graph, actually it curves the other way. It says in the past, the universe was expanding more slowly than we might expect based on current expansion. And that kind of 
it, it's a slight exaggeration, but it seems to have broken modern physics. Why on earth would the universe have been expanding more quickly in the past? And it, it, all I can say is a controversy. We've tried to explain it with dark energy and stuff. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to work through um, a worksheet um, about um, type 1A supernova. Um, I'll just make sure you get it. So there's the graph at the top. Here are the questions. I think um, you should be able to do this without any help from me. So my suggestion is here, you've been listening to me rabbit on for quite a long time, is you stop the um, stop the video, have a go at the worksheet, um, and then come back to it. Right, fast forward through time. Um, let's see how you got on. What is the peak magnitude? Well, it's hard to be exact, isn't it? But something like around 90 minus 19.5. OK, so that's we're getting an idea here. We look at the next section. That that's staggeringly bright, isn't it? Because the sun has an absolute magnitude. This is the brightness. It would be at 10 parsecs. The sun would be barely vi visible in the night sky at 4.8. This would be not as bright as our sun, but it'd be a significant object even during the day if it was at 10 parsecs. So can we gonna estimate the, 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 the peak power output? So how do we do that? Well, we remember that each step on the magnitude scale is times by 2.51. So we're gonna multiply, we've got to do 2.51 to the power, the difference between those two numbers. And the difference between those two numbers, it's 4.8 plus 19.5 is the difference 19 4.8 minus minus 19.5 and then we're going to multiply by the power output 4 times 10 to the 26 And then we're going to times that by 4x26 equals. So we're talking about a power output of about 2 times 10 to the 36 watts. Um, that's There are some assumptions made there that, that, that may, may be exactly true, and we'll come back to those. Why do all type 1A supernova have the same absolute magnitude? Because... The event is triggered by reaching at the same mass in every instance. We've got a slow increase in mass until we reach uh, the 1.4 solar masses, then we get the explosion. How would we go about measuring the distance to a type 1a supernova? Well, we would use this equation. We would measure the peak, the bright, the brightest it appears to be in our night sky on our uh, magnitude scale. We would then compare that to our reference brightness which I've estimated is minus 19.5 estimate the total energy output of a type 1a supernova that's quite tricky um, it's to do with the area under here and the way I'm going to find the area is I'm going to look across here and say there's some value 18 and a half I'm trying to come up with a line so when we work out the area under that line, it'll be the same as the area under that curve. Kind of trying to ignore for the moment the fact this is a log plot uh, and that will make things much more complicated. Just going to get, you know, now I think we'll, we'll stick it 18.5. So that means on average compared to the sun, the power out. So we've got four times 10 to the 26. And now up here, we've got 4.8 plus 18.5 to give an average power output over those 60 days and then it's times 60 times 24 times uh, 60 times 60. Right let's see if I can not clutch up this time 2.51 to the power 4.8 plus 18.5 um, close bracket multiplied by 60 
times 24 times 60 times 60 gives us 1 point, ah, right, but I didn't multiply by the 4 times 10 to the 6, that's all right. Giving us about 4 times 10 to the 42 watts. Now, as I understand it, that's a bit lower than it should be, and you'll see why in a moment. Assuming the light sun has a life of 6 billion years, estimate the sun's energy output. This is a, a comparison that we're asked to make. So we've got 4 times 10 to the 26 multiplied by... 6 times 10 to the 9, that's 6 billion years, times 365, times 24, times 60, times 60. Right. 4x26 times 6x9 times 365 times 24 times 60 times 60 equals... 7 times 10 to the 43, which is pretty close to the 10 to the 44 watt um, joules. <gasps> Unit error, both cases, 10 to the 44 joules. That's about the estimated power output, energy output of the sun and a, supernova, a type 1a supernova. So why is our answer here low? And it's really low by quite a lot. It's more out by more than factor 10, isn't it? I think that the comparison we made here is we're assuming that the, the radiation curve, the black body temperature of, of the two objects is the same. In other words, really, this is the visible, the sun giving out most of its energy in the visible part of the spectrum. I suspect there are lots and lots of energy being given out by the um, supernova in different parts of the spectrum. And that's where our comparison went wrong. Anyway, hope you found that useful. Thank you very much.